I am marrying the prince, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. The reward is enough for you to start a new life or marry one of my other sisters. Please, my darling Arinzi, this is a huge opportunity for me. After hosting a wrestling tournament where she was humiliated, Princess Adan felt deeply embarrassed as the participants shook their heads and walked away, wanting to avoid her. The villagers watching the tournament also left, whispering about her body odor and holding their noses in disgust as they exited the tournament grounds. Arinze approached her with purpose, his face conveying both concern and sadness for her distress. Adan apologized for all her wrongdoings. Arinze pulled her into a comforting embrace. Nuzzling into his shoulder, Arinze said, I have forgiven you and I want to be with you. I don't care what people will say. I love you from the rising of the sun to its setting. I don't care about your father's wealth or heritage. All I want is you. Come away with me, Arinzi whispered. Adan looked up to see the same joyful drummer from the bush, love and hope shining in his eyes. With delightful laughter, Adan once again smelled only warmth and comfort instead of the disgust from the villagers. No splendid royal ball or fawning attention from kings could replace this feeling of home and belonging with Arinsi. She took his hand. Arinsi walked Adan home. They both agreed to meet the next day. Arinsi left to him village. That night, Princess Adan rested uneasy in her chambers, her mind plagued by distressing thoughts. She, she kept replaying the utter humiliation she had endured earlier that day at the wrestling tournament. When her severe body odor had suddenly returned, the crowd had turned on Adan viciously. She vividly remembered their cruel taunts, pointing fingers, disgusted scowls, and the way they all shrank away, covering their noses in revulsion. Hot tears spilled down Adan's cheeks as she recalled a rotten tomato striking her shoulder, hurled by some hateful village boy, followed by peals of laughter. Adan felt completely crushed. She had worked so hard to make herself beautiful and desirable with lovely gowns and jewels in hopes of making a fine match. But it had all been thrown back in her face when her curse of foul-smelling affliction returned without warning. And yet, Adan's weeping softened as she reflected on how her dear Arinzi had rushed to embrace her after she fled the chaotic scene. When no one else would come near the putrid odor she emitted, he alone had wrapped her shaking body tight in his arms, whispering comforting words in her ear. Arinza still loved her in spite of everything. Adan knew she must get to the root of why this curse kept coming back. She resolved to go right away to speak with her father, King Chukwemeka. Surely as monarch, he possessed knowledge of how this plaguing curse befell her so long ago. There must be more she could try to break its cruel hold over her. Adan rose swiftly from her ornate bed and tucked her nightrobe tight around her frame. She lit an oil lamp to light her way through the shadowy corridors and slipped out into the darkness. The night air was warm, filled with chatter of crickets and flutter of moths. Adan followed the stone path briskly to her father's private chambers. Wrapping lightly, she called through the carved wooden door. Father, I apologize for disturbing you so late, but I desperately need answers. Come in, my child, the muffled reply came. Princess Adan turned the brass handle and entered softly. There, she found the king sitting at his desk, brow furrowed, surrounded by scattered parchments. He seemed to be puzzling over something too. You also cannot sleep, father, Aden asked. No, I... I am distressed by what happened to you today, he said heavily, shaking his head. Please, daughter, come sit beside me here. The king shifted his chair toward Adan, taking both her delicate hands in his weathered ones once she had settled next to him. 
His eyes searched her face sadly. Adan took a breath. Father, I hoped speaking with you, I might finally understand. Why have I been cursed with this hideous odor since childhood? Surely you know the full tale. I beg you, please help me comprehend why I am tormented so. Squeezing his daughter's hands, the king spoke slowly. Dearest Adan, there is a painful story from your childhood that I must share. Though it breaks my heart to tell it, it is time you learned the whole truth of events long ago and how they shape the sorrows of today. You see, when you were just a young, carefree girl of seven, your mother, the queen, decided to take you into the village one bright summer morning. She felt it important for you to see more of the kingdom you would one day rule. As the two of you were strolling along, you came across an impoverished beggar woman pleading desperately for money and food. The poor woman had her own tiny daughter by her side, a girl who seemed around the same age as you, my child. Their clothes were just dirty and torn, hanging loosely on their thin, hungry bodies. The little beggar girl's ribs showed through her torn clothes. They looked tired and desperate, my dear. But you were just an innocent girl who didn't understand what it was like to be poor. When the beggar woman saw you and your mother dressed in fine clothes and jewelry, hope appeared in her tired eyes. She quickly came over and knelt before you, pleading, My noble queen and lovely young princess, my daughter and I are very poor and hungry. We haven't eaten in almost five days, and we're starving. Please, could you give us some coins or scraps of bread so we don't die? At that moment, the poor little beggar girl with her was so amazed by the sight of you, a beautiful princess, that she ran forward and hugged you. My dear, I know you didn't mean any harm. You were just scared by the sudden embrace from a strange, dirty child. But in your panic, you pushed the little girl away from you because her ragged clothes touched your fine silk dress. Your royal hands pushed the small girl to the ground. As she looked up at you with confused, teary eyes, you said cruel things I can't forget. Disgusting wretch, you shouted. How dare your dirty hands touch me? You stink. Your smell is awful. In your disgust, you even hit the little beggar girl hard on her face. Then you spat at the poor woman, still kneeling before your mother, asking for help. Disgusting beggars, you yelled. Stay away. Leave us alone. Trying to escape a situation you couldn't understand, you grabbed your mother's arm and pulled her away, back to the palace gates without looking back. I can't forget the shame and regret I feel for not being there that day to guide you both on how royalty should have compassion for the suffering of our people in our hearts. There, on her knees in the dirt, the broken beggar woman cried out in pain, a sound that still echoes in my troubled dreams. Tears filled her eyes as the distressed little girl held onto her mother tightly even as you walked away, my daughter. The beggar woman looked up to the sky and cried out, Beautiful Princess Adan, because of your unnecessary unkindness to my innocent hungry child today, you will be cursed. From now on, for the rest of your life, you will have the worst body odor imaginable. It will be so awful, so horrible, that no one will want to be near you. This kingdom, which has spoiled you as its darling princess, will turn against you. People will laugh and make fun of you, whether you're lovely or not. You will feel embarrassed and alone until your last breath. Then, the beggar woman seemed to transform. Though she still looked tired, she stood tall, her face showing a strange power despite her ragged clothes. She said, I am Izumba the respected goddess of your ancestors. I came as a poor person to, to see if you, a royal, were kind. But you failed to show kindness. So now, spoiled princess, the heavens decide that my curse will be with you forever. With those words, lightning flashed and thunder boomed. 
the beggar woman and her daughter vanished in the wind, as if they were made of dust. At the same time, you, my dear, fell to the ground, unconscious from the goddess's curse. I cried in fear as the guards carried you back to the palace. We called upon all the kingdom's priests, healers, magicians and doctors to try to save you, chanting old spells day and night, hoping to bring back a glimmer of hope that we hadn't lost you forever. Thankfully, after three days of continuous care and attention, you finally opened your eyes. My child? But our happiness at your waking up quickly turned into shock and sadness, mixed with the worst smell any of us had ever experienced. A terrible, choking odor came from your body, spreading through every part of your room. We found out that the beggar woman was actually a goddess in disguise. Her curse affected you, my daughter. You were left with the worst body odor imaginable for your whole life. Despite all the remedies the kingdom tried, potions, salves, prayers and ceremonies, nothing could make it better. We hoped to calm the angry spirit of Izumba, but nothing worked. But everything we tried failed. You, my child, suffered in lonely isolation because of one moment of selfishness that went too far. You not only endured the misery of your condition, but we also saw how the people's feelings towards their beloved princess turned from love to disgust, then neglect, mockery, and even cruelty from those who used to adore you. It was a painful transformation caused by a single, thoughtless act. It's been constant suffering since that fate turned against us long ago. Not because of any initial fault of yours, but because you lacked the gentle guidance you needed. And now, here we are, both grieving souls. Much time has passed, but our regret feels as fresh as the day the beggar goddess cursed us. I should have spent more time teaching you that compassion must be learned early in life. Now this painful lesson comes too late, and at too high a cost for both of us. This truth troubles me when I can't sleep. I hold on to the hope that in the years to come, you might find a chance to learn and grow from your suffering, maybe even help others. If fate allows, even the toughest situations might change with time. We must keep going, my daughter, despite the bad luck we've faced. If we give up hope, we lose everything before we've really lived. After her father, the king, told the painful story of how Princess Adan's body odor was caused by a curse from the beggar goddess Queen Izumba. Adan sat quietly, looking at her shaking hands. She couldn't believe what she had just heard. She realized that when she was a spoiled young girl, she had been unkind because she didn't understand poverty. Now, she was cursed to always have this odor problem, no matter how hard she tried to fix it. Adan felt like something inside her broke when she understood that her life of pain and loneliness was because of one mistake she made as a child. She cried heavily, feeling incredibly alone and hopeless. She barely managed to say thank you for telling me before running out of her father's chambers, crying so much she couldn't see with her father calling after her. Adan hurried through the dark stone corridors, trying not to make any noise that might wake up the people in the palace. She ran out and didn't stop until she reached her small hut at the edge of the grounds. There, she collapsed onto her sleeping mat and gave in to her overwhelming grief and despair. She cried hard, blaming herself and feeling sorry for herself until she fell asleep from exhaustion as the sun began to rise. The next morning, Adan woke up feeling confused for a moment, forgetting the torment of the previous day before reality hit her again. She desperately wanted to talk to her beloved Arins, the only person who stood by her despite her frequent smell problems. Arins fully accepted Adan unlike everyone else. But how could Adan face him now, knowing she could never marry him without exposing him to a life of mockery and humiliation? from the mean villagers alongside her. 
Feeling hopeless and wanting to spare the man who loved her, Adan decided to distance herself from Arinzi. She knew it would break her already fragile heart to lose his constant support and love. She cried bitter tears as she prepared for this, then headed to the secluded grove in the woods where she secretly met the charming drummer boy every afternoon. When Adan arrived and saw Arinzi eagerly waiting with a delighted smile, his happiness nearly made her abandon her decision entirely. Holding back tears and speaking with a shaky voice, Adan quickly explained, her voice trembling with emotion. Erin's, I just found out why I have this terrible problem. I was cursed when I was young for being cruel, and now I'll always have this odor so no one can love me. She took a deep breath through her tears and continued, you're too good and deserving to be with someone like me, who's been disgraced because of my past actions. Looking at his shocked face through her tears, Adan said, I release you from any obligation to someone cursed like me. Please, go love your life happily and find another girl to love and marry instead. Arinze listened silently to Adan's painful words his face showing deep concern. When she finished, his smile faded, replaced by sympathy. He reached out and gently held Adan's trembling hand. My dear princess, you were just a child back then. You couldn't have known what... Arinzi said softly. Adan cried even harder. But can't you see? You're not a bad person. Can't you see? I am disliked for a reason. You deserve someone better than being tied to someone like me, Arinzi said quickly. He moved forward and embraced the shaking sad princess, holding her close as she broke into tears. Hush, my dear, he comforted. You don't need to feel guilty for things that happened long ago. We all have moments we wish we could change. Arinzi gently lifted Adan's chin, meeting her teary eyes. What matters is the kindness and compassion I see in you now. That's what tells me you've learned from your suffering. He wiped Adan's tears away. The past may hurt, but we can find happiness in the present. I don't care what ignorant villagers say. I love you, flaws and all. I'll proudly stand by your side if you'll let me. Adan let out a shaky breath, feeling relieved and grateful. Arinzi still loved her even knowing about her past mistakes, but doesn't it bother you that I am cursed and everyone avoids me? She whispered with uncertainty. You may promise loyalty, but one day you might change your mind when faced with the challenges of sharing my rejected life. Arinzi gently placed her finger over her lips. I choose willingly, with no illusions. Any difficulties will be something we face together. Then he pulled Adana close again. She felt tired, but suddenly hopeful, embraced in unconditional love. No more words were needed in their special quiet sanctuary in the grove. Princess Adan simply snuggled into Arinzi's strong embrace. Finally at peace with her revealed past, she let go of her worries, allowing them to drift away on the soft forest breeze that surrounded the devoted pair as they held on to joy and each other. In the happy weeks after Princess Adan told Arinzi about her cursed condition, the two lovers became even closer and happier together. They found comfort, trust, and understanding in each other's company as their bond grew stronger. One breezy afternoon, as Arinzi walked home after another wonderful meeting with Adan, he realized it was time to talk to his father about wanting to marry the princess. Arinze thought his father might object because of Adan's curse, which caused her to have a bad smell. But Arinze hoped to appeal to his father's kind side and get his blessing. He loved Adan deeply, despite her struggles, and was sure of his feelings for her. When Arinze got home, he found his father, Chief Uzo, the respected healer and elder of the village, busy making potions at the wooden table. Arinze took a deep breath. Father, can we talk? 
It's about Princess Adan. Chief Uzo looked up in surprise but motioned for Arins to continue as he went back to crushing herbs with his stone pestle. Arins spoke earnestly. Father, even though Princess Adani has faced lifelong challenges because of a curse she got when she was young, in these past few months of secret meetings, I've come to love and care for her deeply. The drummer boy clasped his hands together, pleading. I respectfully ask for your blessing to marry her. Chief Uzo stayed silent for a thoughtful moment before responding gently. My son, isn't this princess meant for a life of luxury in the palace? Can you provide for someone who grew up in such privilege? Arinze replied passionately. Father, though Edana was born royale, a curse and scandal forced her out of the court long ago because of ignorance and heartlessness. What I see in my princess is her beautiful soul. We find joy and comfort in each other that no wealth could replace. I promise to stand by her side through everything. With this heartfelt declaration, a slow smile appeared on Chief Uzo's weathered face. He stood up and placed an approving hand on his son's shoulder. Then she has my blessing as well, my loyal son. I believe true love can conquer all. Later, as Arinzi explained Princess Adan's curse to his father, Chief Uzo's eyes lit up with inspiration. As the village's skilled spiritual healer, he wondered if the gods and ancestors might guide him to lift Adan's curse. Even after years of failed attempts, Chief Uzo grabbed Arinzi's shoulder eagerly. My son, bring Princess Adan to me at the next village market in two days, behind my herb stall. I'll perform a cleansing ritual that I believe could finally break this curse. Just bring her and let the spirits of goodwill do their ancient magic. Arinzi felt a wave of relief and hope at his father's words. He thanked his wise father warmly for his blessing. As he hurried back to Adan to share the joyful news that Chief Uzo agreed to their marriage and might be able to lift her curse, he prayed fervently that his father's skills would succeed where others had failed, finally freeing his beloved from her suffering. The next sunny morning, Arines eagerly went to meet Princess Adan at their usual spot in the shaded glen. His spirits were high with hope after his father's promise to perform a powerful cleansing ritual to lift Adan's curse when the time was right. Arinza hummed happily, imagining the joy on Princess Adan's face when he shared the promising news. However, as he entered their leafy hideaway, all his pleasant thoughts vanished, replaced by awe at the sight of the beautiful princess waiting for him. Adan had already arrived and stood up gracefully from the soft grass to greet Arinza with a radiant smile and a tender kiss that made his heart flutter. After they settled comfortably together and caught up on their time apart, Arinz took both of Adan's hands and looked into her expectant eyes. My princess, I have wonderful news, he exclaimed, unable to contain his excitement. Arinza told Adan about asking his father, Chief Uzo, for permission to marry her. My father not only agreed to our marriage despite your struggles, but he also believes that his special healing skills might finally free you from the curse, Arinze exclaimed. He explained Chief Uzo's plan for Arinze to bring Adana to him during the next village market day. Princess Adan listened carefully her eyes widening with cautious hope. She felt a mix of timid joy and disbelief, a glimmer of hope, breaking through her resignation to a life of affliction. Do you really believe your father can break this curse when so many powerful spells have failed? Adan whispered, tears of fragile hope shimmering on her eyelashes. Arinzi gently kissed each of her flushed cheeks and looked at her with determination. If anyone has the ability and favor with the ancient gods to change your fate, it's my father. He comes from a long line of people who serve spiritual forces beyond our understanding. 
Adan let out a soft sigh, a small glimmer of hope taking root in her heart. Hand in hand, they stood up and went to tell the princess's father, King Chukwemeka, about this ray of hope. The king listened solemnly to Arinz's hopeful story. However, he shook his head sadly, pity and regret filling his eyes. I worry this might only prolong my daughter's heartbreak. We've tried every rumored solution across five kingdoms over the years, all in vain. But if this healer can spark even a glimmer of hope in Adan's eyes, I won't object, King Chukwemeka said, giving them his blessing. Adanair and Arinze barely slept that night, filled with delicate anticipation. Several days later, on the morning of the bustling village market as Chief Uzo had planned, large crowds gathered along the grassy banks of the winding river that bordered the kingdom. News of the significant cleansing ritual for Princess Adan, to be conducted by the respected village elder and healer, Chief Uzo, had quickly spread by word of mouth and attracted multitudes. Representatives, townspeople and merchants from all five surrounding kingdoms journeyed to witness the ceremony. Many brought sick relatives or friends, hoping to benefit from Chief Uzo's legendary talents. Kings and high priests from each kingdom, recognizable in their gleaming robes of status, also attended with great interest. Despite their own failed attempts to lift Adan's curse over the years, they came to observe. Colorfully clad female dancers with shell-adorned anklets gathered, ready to perform. The royal drummers assembled too, prepared to play sacred beats invoking divine spirit powers. Even Princess Adan's parents, the Queen and King Chukwameka, quietly joined the gathered crowd. Finally, Chief Uzo appeared, wearing a majestic feathered crown representing his ancestral authority and leopard print clothing, showing his command of ancient mystic forces. He emerged slowly from the forest fringe by the river. Surrounding him respectfully was a group of muscular, bare-chested warrior guards, painted with sacred white ochre clay designs. They carried jars of purified water from the river and baskets filled with ritual elements like powders made from rare rainforest roots, exotic bird feathers, elephant hide bracelets, and curved tusks from legendary sea beasts. Princess Adan sat gracefully beside him on a woven reed mat, wearing a soft ivory gown. However, her eyes showed her anxiety. Arinze knelt behind her, holding her shoulders firmly. Adan sought his warmth as her only comfort amid the uncertainty and memories of past disappointments before numerous councils of mystics. Just beyond, King Chukwemeka stood protectively with his advisors, who had come to witness any miracle for themselves. Soon, the steady beat of hide drums filled the air, signaling everyone to gather. Be blessed, my children, Chief Uzo's strong voice echoed across the area. Today, we gather at this sacred river, seeking divine pardon and grace from forces once angered. He looked directly at Princess Adan, his gaze intense. With faith and reverence, I will use every power granted to me by the Creator to help this blameless young lady who has suffered for so long. In response to his words, the drummers began a complex, accelerating beat. The dancers started their spirited routine their bracelets jingling. Everyone watched eagerly as the tense scene unfolded at the shoreline, filled with fervent hopes. A tense silence fell over the crowd as Chief Uzo lifted his staff towards the sky, seeking divine intervention. Everyone watched closely as he lit herbs in a bowl, filling the air with a strange, sweet-smelling smoke. Then Chief Uzo began a dance, following ancient traditions passed down through generations. His chants, spoken in an ancient language, seemed to echo through the air, sending shivers down the spines of many. The sounds of the forest faded away, as if paying respect to the ceremony. Princess Adan closed her eyes, overwhelmed by memories from her past. Memories of a beggar child she had once rejected, and the harsh words she had spoken without remorse. Meanwhile, 
The other kings observed Chief Uzo's actions with solemn approval, while Adan struggled to control her emotions. After an hour of intense ritual, Chief Uzo grew weary, examining the bones and shells scattered on the ground for signs from the spirits. Unfortunately, the signs remained unclear and unfavorable. Disappointment rippled through the crowd as Chief Uzo prepared to make a second plea. This time, an assistant drew a small amount of blood from Adan's wrist as an offering. Yet, despite their efforts, the ritual was unsuccessful. As the morning progressed, Chief Uzo continued to pour all his energy into a third and fourth dance, sprinkling rare purple powders over Adan's kneeling form. However, despite his heartfelt efforts, the crowd grew increasingly doubtful and restless. Some began to grumble, accusing Uzo of being a fraud. Adan fought back tears, feeling the familiar sting of disappointment. Arinza held her close, offering words of comfort while glaring at the hecklers. Even the dignitaries shook their heads in disbelief, unsure of what to do until the ceremony was over. Only King Chukwemeka remained, holding on to hope that the situation would somehow change. Meanwhile, Chief Uzo felt exhausted and confused. His methods, which had always succeeded in the past, were failing him now. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Uzo drank some water brought by young Arinzi and appealed to the ancestors for guidance. He realized that only love could overcome the cruelty of the curse. With newfound understanding, Uzo decided to approach the situation with raw humanity rather than relying solely on official rituals. Uzo took off his fancy clothes and went to Adan, who was sad and tired, and held her hands tightly, looking into her eyes with seriousness. In a loud voice, he called out to Queen Izumba in the sky. Instead of doing fancy dances, Uzo surprised everyone by kneeling with Adan on the muddy ground. With their heads bowed and hands together, Uzo spoke from his heart to Queen Izumba. He asked her to listen to him, saying he was her humble servant. He begged her to show mercy to Princess Adan if there was any goodness left in her. After speaking, Uzo went quiet, and everyone waited anxiously, hoping for a miracle. Seconds felt like forever as they waited to see what would happen. Suddenly, strong winds rose from the calm waters, swirling around the ritual site. People gasped, as spirits of ancestors appeared above the river. Then, right before Chief Uzo, a beautiful goddess emerged in a flash of bright sunlight piercing through the clouds. She wore threads of pure copper. People shielded their eyes and turned away, recognizing the divine presence of Goddess Izumba. When the glow faded a bit, everyone looked at the goddess. Izumba spoke to Chief Uzo in a kind voice, acknowledging his devotion to Princess Adan. She looked at Adan, who trembled but met her gaze. After a moment, the goddess said, So be it, child. Even the coldest heart can find its way to light. Then, with a gentle smile that seemed tinged with sadness, Goddess Izumba spoke. I take back the curse I unfairly placed many years ago in a moment of my own pain. She blessed Chief Uzo, saying, Continue to serve your people with love. The heavens are pleased with deeds done from the heart. With these kind words still lingering in the air, Izumba's glowing form suddenly transformed back into that of a humble peasant, before disappearing as quickly as she had appeared. A deep silence fell over the crowd as they absorbed the miraculous events they had just witnessed. Then, a jubilant cheer erupted as the people celebrated the merciful actions of the goddess, while Chief Uzo beamed with pride. However, amidst the joyous commotion, Princess Adan suddenly gasped and collapsed. Arinza rushed to catch her, calling out her name anxiously as her parents hurried to help revive her. At Chief Uzo's calm direction, the limp princess was swiftly moved to his secluded dwelling 
away from the public eye for recovery. There, for countless Anxiu's howls, while the crowds outside slowly dispersed, Princess Adan lay eerily still on Chief Uzo's woven sleeping mat. Her distraught mother wept inconsolably against King Chukwemeka's chest, equally distressed. But the wise healer only smiled at their worry. Be patient. The young lady's spirit undergoes a profound transformation, crossing from one reality to the next. This indicates the goddess's complete forgiveness. True to his prediction, after a full day and night of deep slumber, Princess Ardan finally stirred, weak as a newborn cub. As her blurry vision cleared and she saw her beloved Arins kneeling beside her, the princess's voice quivered with apprehension. Please, has the goddess's curse truly been lifted from me after all this time? Holding her breath, she slowly raised a trembling hand to her face. Then, she gently inhaled through her nose. Waiting for a few tense moments, she took another fuller breath. And then, suddenly, she sat up straight in amazed delight. Princess Adan couldn't stop crying tears of joy and thanking the heavens loudly. I no longer have that awful smell. It's a miracle. Thank you, Goddess Izumba. Chief Uzo had done the impossible through his strong belief and selfless acts. His ritual had finally freed Princess Adan from her curse, allowing her to embrace a future filled with love and acceptance that had been denied to her for so long. The villages celebrated together for days, united by the marriage of two resilient souls who had grown stronger together. Six months later, Princess Adan and Arinze were deeply in love and making plans to marry. Both of their families supported them wholeheartedly. King Chukwemeka, Adan's father, had come to admire Arinze for his unwavering dedication to Adan. Chief Uzo, Arinze's father, had welcomed Adan with open arms from the very beginning, even when she was still struggling with the curse. Not long ago, Chief Uzo, Arinze and their families approached King Chukwemeka to ask for Princess Adan's hand in marriage. The king happily agreed. On that special day, everyone gathered to celebrate the young couple. They were overjoyed to finally give their blessing to the union after years of courtship and overcoming the curse. Princess Adan was beaming with tears of happiness. Over the next few months, Arins worked tirelessly to save money for Princess Adan's bridal dowry, as was customary. He took on extra drumming gigs and woodcarving jobs, excited about the prospect of marrying Adan. Then, one day, shocking news spread throughout the kingdom. Prince Ukandu, who was expected to become the next king of the powerful Okanga kingdom, arrived unexpectedly. His presence was significant not only for his kingdom, but also for Princess Adan's. He boldly announced that if he couldn't marry Princess Adan, he wouldn't marry anyone else. Prince Ukandu, who was handsome and very wealthy, was determined to win Princess Adan's heart. He visited the palace every day, showering her with expensive gifts like jewelry, fine clothes, and even exotic pets from distant lands. Troubling rumors soon reached Arinzi. People said that the respected prince wanted to marry Adan and make her his queen. It seemed Adan was considering his advances, accepting his lavish presence. Arinz felt sad and worried. He had stood by Adan during her toughest times, but now this rich prince threatened to take her away with his wealth. Feeling heartbroken, Arinz rushed to meet Adan in their secret forest spot. He needed to know if she planned to leave him for the prince. Adan could see his worry before he even spoke. She reached out to hold his hands. My love, please don't doubt my feelings for you just because a prince is trying to impress me, Adan pleaded. What we share is more important than material things. She looked at Arinzi with meaning. Prince Ukandu might have lots of wealth and high status to offer, but the happiness I feel just being with you, watching chickens pecking in the village, is priceless. 
Arinzi blinked away tears of gratitude at her heartfelt words. Princess Adan came close and kissed his cheek gently. There's no one else for me but you, my once humble drummer boy who has become so much more, the rhythm of my heart. Don't worry about Prince Ukandu's pursuit. I'll handle it gently in time. Completely reassured by Princess Adan's words, Arinza left their meeting in the forest feeling much better. He went back to work happily, earning money for their wedding celebration. Meanwhile, Prince Ukandu continued tirelessly, trying to make Princess Adan his bride. Used to getting his way, the spoiled young royal couldn't accept Adan's polite refusals. Instead, he kept showing up unannounced, pleading with increasing intensity. One morning, while Princess Adan was taking a relaxed walk with her guards, Prince Ukandu managed to stop them. He looked very pleased and joined the princess on her walk. As they walked through the countryside, Prince Ukandu started talking smoothly, praising Arinzi for helping to lift Adan's curse, which even the best healers couldn't do. Princess, surely after that drummer's help in freeing you from the curse, you must agree that only a prince like me would make a suitable husband, Ukandu said arrogantly. Adan was about to argue back, but the prince continued smoothly. Imagine, I would treat Arinze with so much kindness and favor for what he did. I could give him riches beyond imagination. I would build a huge mansion for Arinze's family with servants to help them with everything. Your former love wouldn't have to do any more hard work. Please, Princess Adan, consider this offer and tell Arinze about it. At least do me the honor of taking this offer to Arinze for consideration. Although Princess Adan felt bothered by Prince Ukandu's entitled behavior and false generosity towards Arinze, she reluctantly agreed to share the prince's message with Arinze later that day when they were supposed to meet secretly among the trees and vines. She realized that this could be a great opportunity for her to become the ruler and a proud princess of the entire kingdom if Prince Ukandu assigned the throne. Recognizing that it would be difficult for any woman to reject such an offer, she decided to offer Arin's money, the offer Prince Ukandu made, and marry Prince Ukandu. Princess Adan couldn't ignore the appeal of Ukandu's proposal. That night, Princess Adan went to bed early, claiming to have a mild headache. In reality, her mind was consumed by thoughts about Prince Ukandu's proposal. By offering Arinzi immense wealth, she compared the two men and concluded that being a queen was the best choice. Tears of frustration streamed down her face. After enduring her curse and feeling eternally isolated for so long, now she had two suitors vying for her hand when she had little hope before. On one hand, her heart was drawn to Arinze, who had been humble yet unwaveringly loyal. He had uplifted Adan's spirit through countless rejections. Together, they had built a genuine connection and offered each other understanding and support during difficult times. No amount of wealth or nobility could outweigh Arinzi's steadfast loyalty and his ability to see the true essence of who Adan was beyond her curse. Adan finally fell asleep, her mind filled with turmoil. The next morning, Arenze happily whistled as he went to the grove where he and Adan usually met. He laid out a blanket and unpacked sweetberry tarts and spiced tea that he had made just for her. Arenze hummed contentedly as he waited for Adan to arrive, but as the sun rose higher in the sky, there was still no sign of the princess. Arenze's excitement turned into disappointment mixed with worry. In all the times they had met secretly in this grove, Adan had never failed to come, or at least send a message if she was going to be late. Confused and increasingly anxious, after waiting for hours with no sign of her, Arinze sadly packed up the untouched food and returned home. The next day, Arinze went to their usual forest spot earlier than usual, hoping everything was okay with Princess Adan and wanting to see her smile again. But once again, Princess Adan didn't show up, and there was no note or message explaining why she wasn't there. Arinze started feeling really worried. The next day, and the day after that, 
the princess still didn't come. Meanwhile, Princess Adan walked through the palace halls, feeling trapped in deep confusion. She was torn between the recent talk with Prince Ukandu. Princess Adan realized she had to make a tough decision quickly, before Arinza came back thinking she had heartlessly left him without a word. One gloomy, rainy afternoon, Princess Adan made a tough decision after thinking alone for hours. With a heavy heart, she went to her father, King Chukwemeka, and sadly told him she agreed to marry Prince Ukandu, and that is the final decision, aim to maintain the royalty in her lineage, and him and the prince will join hand and settle Arinzi and his family with gift and money. The king, feeling sad for his daughter, listened with understanding as she shared the story of Prince Ukandu's persistent pursuit and promises of prosperity for Arinzi's family. King Chukwemeka knew well the heavy responsibilities that came with being royalty. Seeing Adan give up her hope for reciprocal love was deeply painful for him. He stepped forward and comforted the quietly crying Adan. My dear daughter, we royals often have to put aside our personal feelings for the sake of our duties to the state and crown, he said with a heavy heart. But I must confess, if only you could give fate a little more time. Here, King Chukwemeka paused, a curious smile appearing. Adan looked at her father with a puzzled expression, wiping away her tears. What do you mean, father? Time for what? The king chuckled softly, a hint of hope returning to his tired eyes. Just be patient, my child. Keep an eye out in the coming days for destiny to set things right, through forces beyond our control. And with that cryptic message, Adan couldn't get any more information out of her smiling father that strange day. Feeling confused, the princess went back to her lonely room to struggle with the difficult decision she had to make. She decided to go ahead with her plans to offer Arinzi money for his past help in removing her curse. She accepted the harsh reality that she would marry Prince Ukandu and become queen, even though it meant giving up the possibility of being with Arinzi. It was a sacrifice she felt she had to make for the greater good, even if it broke his heart. The next morning, Princess Adan gathered her courage, dressed in simple clothes like those worn by villagers, and walked hesitantly through the forest to their special spot. Her heart felt heavy as she saw Arinzi already waiting under their favorite tree, his eyes closed with a hopeful smile on his lips. Adan felt a pang of sadness realizing he had come early, excited for her return after so long. But now, she had to break his heart with her news. Approaching Arinzi quietly so as not to startle him, Adan gracefully knelt on the picnic blanket they had woven together in happier times. Memories flooded her mind, filling her with both joy and sorrow. Arinz sensed her presence and opened his eyes, his face lighting up with joy at seeing her again. Adan, he exclaimed, reaching for her hands with love. I've been so worried. What kept you? But his expression changed when he saw Adan's plain clothes and simple appearance. Worry replaced his joy as he studied her face closely. Is something wrong, my love? He asked, growing more alarmed. Princess Adan tried to speak, but sadness choked her words. Her teary eyes showed the difficult news she had to share. Arinzi looked at her with compassion and concern, sensing something was wrong. He held her hands tighter, urging her to tell him what was troubling her. Taking a deep breath, Adan began to explain everything that had happened, how Prince Ukandu had approached her, insisting on marrying her, and offering riches for Arinzi's family if she agreed. She confessed her struggle between wanting to follow her heart and feeling obligated to consider the offer because of all Arinz had done for her. I want you to know, my dear Arinzi, that I only want what's best for you and your family, Adan said sadly. You've sacrificed so much to help me, and I can't ignore that. I have made up my mind to marry the prince. He promises to give you gifts and riches beyond imagination. He would build a huge mansion for you and your family, with servants to help you with everything. 
Your family deserves rewards for the sacrifices they made to stand by me. I am marrying the prince, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. The reward is enough for you to start a new life or marry one of my other sisters. Please, my darling Arinzi, this is a huge opportunity for me.